Thanks, Art. Um, can we see the PowerPoint? Yep, looks great. great. Excellent. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Anna Steele. I'm the director of consulting at uh, Just Tech. We provide um, technology-related consulting services to legal aid providers. Uh, prior to that, I was a technology coordinator at Legal Assistance of Western New York, based out of our Geneva office. And today, I am joined by Angela Tripp from Michigan, uh, Hannah Kaufman from Illinois, and Susan Lucas from Pennsylvania. And what we are going to do today is go on a little bit of a road trip. Um, there are a lot of really great technology projects that are happening around the country, uh, both at the program level, regional level, and statewide level. And um, there's obviously a lot of infrastructure, both technical and, I guess, human infrastructure that's kind of going on beyond behind the scenes that allow these types of projects to happen. So that's what I wanted to explore today, to unpack today. Um, and hope that uh, folks have um, something to learn from us and uh, what we have been doing in our states. And so um, I'm going to start today with uh, New York. Um, so I've spent about 15 years of my life in New York, uh, both in early childhood and my college years and my legal aid years. Um, so we'll always have a very special place in my heart, especially professionally, as it's where I got introduced to legal aid and fell in love with it. Um, and, you know, New York is not unique in that it has some pretty stark differences between the urban and the rural parts of the state. Um, obviously, the, the rural parts of the state don't have the same access to the same resources as the more urban programs have. Um, and it can be really challenging for uh, more rural providers to fill sysadmin jobs, tech support positions, um, as they just don't necessarily have the talent pool that you have in, in urban areas. Uh, that's not to say it doesn't exist. There are the uh, rural programs do have great folks uh, working with them, but it can it can be really hard to fill those positions. And so geography obviously poses a little bit of a barrier uh, for tech. Mm -hmm. um, but we have worked as a state to kind of find ways to overcome uh, those barriers. And with all the providers, right, there's uh, around 90 providers in New York alone. Um, so there's a lot of room for collaboration there. Uh, fortunately, we do receive funding from a number of streams, the biggest ones being LSC, our Office of Court Administration, and IOLA. Um, but all that being said, we don't have centralized tech services and uh, the programs throughout the state have a mix of staff and consultants. So there's obviously a lot going on in New York State and we really wanted to make sure uh, that we are sharing resources, we're not duplicating services, uh, that both the program directors and the tech folks are learning from each other. And um, we're really fortunate that we have two different working groups in New York that allow this to happen. Uh, so the first that we're going to talk about is Nice Tech. Uh, started formally in 2012, uh, the New York State Technology Coordination Work Group, also now known as Nice Tech, uh, is a group of stakeholders that are devoted to brainstorming and implementing ideas that use technology to improve the delivery of legal services. Uh, members of the work group initially included non-tech decision makers and managers and supervisors within legal services organizations, but over time it has involved, evolved to include also the tech technology responsible people and technologists who work for these different organizations. We have a small group of facilitators, um, usually around two or three people. Um, those folks have kind of changed over time, but um, those who were involved initially in the beginning of Nice Tech are still involved, whether they're facilitators or not. Um, and we have monthly calls. Uh, in, and these can happen in a variety of different formats. Our agendas often include discussions around policies and projects. Uh, one of my favorite parts of these calls is what's called Around the Horn, where everybody takes about two minutes to update folks on what's going on in their individual programs. We try and make time for that once every couple of months to make sure um, that folks have a chance to kind of share and learn from each other. Um, one year, we were alternating between these administrative calls with set agendas and webinars. Uh, the webinars were great because there would be a nice tech member who would kind of take, uh, they would adopt a month, they would help coordinate a webinar, and uh, they would be very similar to the ones that uh, Sart was talking about at the beginning, um, but would have a New York twist on them and be uh, really kind of honed in on some of the New York uh, state specific issues. We've had webinars on online intake and triage. We've had webinars on security and, and, some, and data visualization. 
Um, so really kind of unpacking some of these issues that are getting talking about it, talked about at a national scale and applying them to what's happening in New York. Uh, the group has also uh, brainstormed and submitted panels for different conferences, for TIG, for EJC, and for um, our the New York Bar Association's partnership conference. And with the goal of, right, you know, TIG is tech focused, EJC, you're seeing more and more tech uh, panels happening, but our the New York State Bar Association, Association conference, we really wanted to plug it and make sure that we were plugging in to that audience and making sure that the program directors and, and the supervising attorneys and the staff attorneys were aware of what was going on tech-wise. Uh, the group also offers comments and support on initiatives as a group. So if there's something that we really like and are excited about or something that uh, we have a little bit of pause about and want to be uh, bring up some considerations, we will do that as NYSEC. Um, and we also, the past few years, have helped coordinate the statewide technology conference, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So the other group we have is uh, the technology working group for our permanent commission on access to justice. So when the permanent uh, commission on access to justice was getting started, it was initially a task force and uh, technology kept coming up as a way to address the justice gap. So eventually the members of the task force decided to create a working group to specifically focus on technology related issues. Um, this working group publishes a report annually that makes a series of recommendations to the permanent commission on access to justice uh, for their report and in the past we've seen a number of different recommendations uh, one was surrounding a survey a statewide survey that was done on um, technology within new york state and some additional analysis was done and within its within its report the permanent commission reported out on some recommendations around staffing and policies and security and training kind of the classic issues that um that legal aid providers know and realize that they need to enhance as far as their technology services go uh, we've seen recommendations on the pro bono tech initiative which i'll be talking about in a little bit uh, we've seen recommendations on uh, the two pilots that are currently happening for online intake and triage. Uh, the, rec the commission recommended that these happen. Uh, two different uh, groups, one in Western New York and one in New York City, secured some funding, and we've been piloting some online intake and triage projects specifically for consumer law projects. Uh, the commission recommended that while that these pilots kind of happen in tandem, so they could continue to kind of communicate with each other, share resources, share ideas, um, and that's what happened. Um, I worked on the project. Uh, in Western New York, when I was with Law New York, the Western New York Consumer Help Finder, it is uh, it is launched and operational at this point. That was funded um, by LSC through through uh, TIG grant, and then Chris Schwartz from the City Bar Justice Center down in New York City uh, led the initiative to develop the New York City Consumer Help Finder uh, with support from the New York Community Trust and uh, donations from Legal Server. So that was kind of a really cool. Uh, recommendation that came out of a need that the permanent commission saw. They saw a need for uh, additional services related to consumer law and, and integrated that with technology and now we have these two pilot projects that are happening. Um, so, you know, in general, I think New York is really fortunate that we have an Access to Justice Commission. We have an Access to Justice Commission that really supports um, the technology and that has its own kind of group of folks who are really focusing on technology issues. So one of the coolest things I think to come out of the collaboration between Nice Tech and the working group was our statewide technology conference. So this has happened, our inaugural one was in 2015. Um, we've had our fourth this year at Cornell Tech out on Roosevelt Island, which was really exciting. Um, these conferences are really geared towards uh, leadership and management as well as the technologists or the tech responsible people, um, we found it really important to get both of those folks in the room um, because often you see technologists go off to tech conferences, they have really good ideas, they come back, they present them to their leadership and leadership's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So this has allowed kind of both of those folks to be in the same room together while still um, learning in a way that makes the most sense for their position in their individual programs. So we have multiple tracks, right, that allow for um, leadership to explore what they need to explore, the techies to explore what they need to explore, and we also have a number of plenary sessions. It's only a one-day conference, um, which has proved to be challenging because there's obviously a lot of information out there to be 
uh, discussed, but some of the highlights include peer-to-peer uh, -peer strategizing. Uh, it's a one-hour session. Uh, tables are set up with a facilitator and a topic, and you sit down at a table, talk about this issue commonly for half an hour, and then switch um, to talk about another issue with folks. People really seem to like that. It really allows you to kind of pick and choose what, um, what you want to learn about and still have a facilitator at the table who um, can help lead the conversation and can serve, a, serve as an expert in that area. Um, and then obviously one of the major highlights of this is just being able to get everybody together for a day. Um, I know, mo you know many of us work on projects with folks that we've never met in person, so it's a lot of fun to put faces to voices from conference calls um, and really have some time to talk about uh, innovative initiatives and, and next steps on projects. Uh, this year was really interesting because we had a theme for the conference rather than just kind of pulling out topics that we generally wanted to discuss. Uh, this year's theme was on integrations and um, how to make different, make sure that our different systems are able to talk to each other and making sure that we're doing work outside of silos. So it was really interesting and, and really rather inspiring uh, conference this, this year. And on our second day, we had a smaller group of folks meet uh, more technical focus to really kind of get into the nitty gritty as far as these integrations are, what APIs are available, um, what's not available, what data can be shared, what data can be transferred. Um, and a lot of really cool conversations came out of, of that day. So we're really excited about kind of hopefully incorporating that into some of our following conferences. So quick stop before I move to something else. Um, I wanna talk quickly about lessons learned as far as the technology conference goes. Uh, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, don't pack too much material into one day. Um, it's really, it can be really exhausting to be in a conference all day long. And when you're learning a lot and there's a lot of moving around and there's a lot of new topics getting discussed, um, it can be really challenging. I think smaller breakouts uh, equal more, more participation, which is great. Panel discussions are awesome and a great way to get a lot of information out at one time. But we've learned that mixing those up with these with smaller breakout groups and these peer-to-peer -peer strategizing sessions have really been uh, successful. Um, for anybody who's been in a, to a conference before, you'll I'm sure you'll agree with me on this. Ending the day with an interactive session can be really challenging. Uh, trying to get folks to uh, share their thoughts or their ideas uh, or next steps at the end of a full day conference can be tough. Um, so what we have kind of done in lieu of that is ending the day with the facilitators for the different presentations and, and panel groups uh, reporting out on what happened. Um, so anything that didn't happen in a plenary can still be discussed. And I think building in time for networking and follow-up is really important. Um, some of the greatest things that come out of conferences are those backhaul conversations, conversations over lunch, conversations at happy hour afterwards. And so you really want to build in that time for folks because at the end of the day, conference is over, we all get back to our desks, we have 600 emails that need to be caught up on and we really don't have time to synthesize and apply what we've learned um, and follow up with all those people that we intended on doing. So giving people a little bit of, building some structured time into, the, into your conference is really important. So the last New York initiative I wanted to touch on real quick was our uh, CIO work group project. So this came out of the technology working group um, with the Permanent Commission on Access to Justice, and we brought in CIOs from the private law firm community who were willing to do some pro bono work for legal aid law firms. And what we discovered is these CIOs really had a lot to learn as far as um, how legal aid worked and how different it was from um, the big multinational firms that they were a part of. So we decided to do some pro bono assessments. And this obviously greatly benefited the uh, folks who participated in the assessment as well. So the CIOs came in uh, and they did some assessments for programs all around the state, both in the city and upstate, and uh, reported back. You know, some folks did some uh, very targeted feedback as a result of these technology assessments. And both the CIOs found it very educational and the uh, Providers found it to be a really useful to learn about uh, how to better tech plan and what resources they may need to use and, and how to kind of prioritize what updates need to be made over time. So that then evolved, right? Everybody now wants an assessment, right? And so that evolved into this kind of self-guided assessment that, that the CIOs 
worked to create. And there was a survey monkey that would go out, you would answer a series of questions, folks did some analysis on the answers to that questions, and then a webinar would be given on that particular topic. So it would be kind of group res recommendations as opposed to like very targeted recommendations. But again, we found this to be a really great way uh, to utilize these CIOs who are willing to, to do pro bono work and be able to kind of share uh, their knowledge as much as possible um, without, uh, you know, we want it to be inclusive as possible and we wanted as many legal aid providers to take advantage of that as possible. So that um, project just recently wrapped up as well. And it's been a really exciting initiative. And um, as part of it also, due to some of their relationships, uh, the CIOs were able to kind of negotiate some uh, competitive pricing on uh, different software packages uh, for legal aid providers if they wanted to move based on some of the recommendations that they made. So another quick stop with some lessons learned. Um, a project like this needs centralized project management. Um, you know, one common theme throughout this whole thing is that none of this was really funded. Um, there's no like real centralized body on this. This all of these different projects came out of seeing a need and responding to it. Um, so that's one of the big challenges with the CIO project is that uh, as an unfunded project, there was no real uh, central project management uh that obviously i think it would have benefited a lot from uh law firms also don't have the pro bono capacity that they used to surrounding technology uh you know the security issues alone in private law firms have just totally ballooned um so they are dedicating obviously more and more and more of their resources to make sure that they are operating in a way that makes a lot of sense for them security and tech wise so they don't necessarily have the uh, the pro bono opportunities aren't necessarily as available as they once were. And as I talked about in the beginning, the whole urban rural divide in New York state, uh, it gets really challenging to get mid-size firm CIOs from upstate to be involved. We did have some, which was awesome, um, but it obviously uh, presents a challenge for a project like that. Um, so with that just a couple of takeaways for you on this section of our road trip um you know as, as i was talking about you don't need a funding you don't need a big funding stream to tackle any of this uh you need folks who are excited about technology who are dedicated to the cause and who are willing to give give up an hour a month to start a technology working group locally and within your state and can see what initiatives and what connections and what resources can be gathered from there um, so I definitely recommend, um, if you don't already have a technology working group within your state, to consider looking into it, even if it starts at a regional level, even at a programmatic level. If you're a program that has seven, eight, nine offices, uh, make sure that internally you're collaborating and you're just talking regularly about the tech um, that is happening within your program and that can hopefully blossom into something greater. Uh, so again, I'm Anna Steele. Here is my email address if you have any questions about what we've done in New York. Um, I'm happy to talk. If I have any folks from New York on the call today who are not currently members of NYSTEC, nice uh, feel free to shoot me an email and we can get you a part of that group. And now I will pass us on to Angela. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I am here with my co-pilot and cat, Claire. She's very excited for her YouTube debut. Um, I am going to talk to you about um, what we do in Michigan. In Michigan, um, we have a, a pretty different setup from New York. You'll hear a lot of the, the same ideas, um, but we're structured very differently. And so I'm going to talk to you about um, all the, the things that we do in, in the Midwest. <clears throat> um, First of all, I have uh, a couple of different job roles, um, but I'm here today as the um, manager of the Michigan Poverty Law Program's IT department. Um, I also am the director of the Michigan Legal Help Program, um, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. So in Michigan, um, I wanna give you an overview of the technology resources and where they are located. Um, the Michigan Poverty Law Program is a statewide uh, research and litigation support office. Um, we have six subject matter experts and an IT staff of three. Um, this program was funded um, 
in the year 2000 um, by our IOLTA funder, the Michigan State Bar Foundation. Um, we are not LSC funded in any way or restricted in any way. Um, and primarily we, um, as an organization, focus on um, support, litigation support for attorneys all over the state, um, training support for all the legal aid programs in the state, administrative and legislative advocacy, and a certain amount of IT support. Um, in Michigan, there are about 12 individual legal aid providers. So while we do have the urban rural split, as you can see in my photos here of Detroit and Pictured Rocks, um, it's, much, it's a much closer split than what New York has, and we're just a much smaller state. So we have five LSC-funded providers that cover the whole state, um, and about seven other legal services providers, depending on um, how you count everything. Um, all programs have their own technology staff, um, but a lot of duties are handled centrally by the Michigan Poverty Law Program. Um, the, all of the providers of legal aid uh, work together. Um, they have a Legal Services Association in Michigan. It's actually a little nonprofit, um, and we meet every two months to talk about issues related to legal services. Um, and we engage a lobbyist, and so we, um, that's how we work together as a state um, of different legal aid providers. And part of that Asso Legal Services Association in Michigan is the Legal Services Computer Committee, um, kind of like what Anna was talking about, although <clears throat> um, not as exciting as, you know, we don't have webinars, we just have bi-monthly meetings um, to talk about issues um, statewide projects, issues common to all, and special requests. Um, some of the things that we've worked through as a group were online intake and texting, um, which were statewide projects that, that MPLP undertook. Um, sometimes we talk about uh, issues that are common to everyone, such as electronic data storage or ending of support for different Windows platforms, um, technology reporting needs for each program, um, and things like that. So it's more of a problem-solving uh, group rather than a shared education. But I love the idea, Anna, of, of throwing some webinars in there to keep people engaged. Um, we don't have an access to justice committee. Um, we have what we call a state planning body. Um, and there is no specific technology subgroup of that. Um, our State Bar Foundation is our IOLTA funder, which, as I mentioned, funds the Michigan Poverty Law Program, including our IT services. Um, we have a nearly statewide intake and advice hotline called the Council and Advocacy Law Line. And so MPLP works closely with them on all things technical related to um, the hotline. Um, and while we don't have a tech subcommittee of the state planning body, we do have um, a newly formed Integrated Technology and Innovations Committee. Um, and that group is made up of leaders from legal services, um, the Michigan State Bar, and the State Court Administrative Office. And we meet every two months um, really around trying to make sure that all of our different technology projects are coordinated um, and integrate with one another because all, all of us um, tend to, you know, we, we cover different aspects of the legal community, and so we want to make sure that all of our projects work together as well as possible and that we're not duplicating services. Um, so Michigan um, is an example of a state that undertakes um, big technology projects centrally in order to increase efficiency and expansive service for everyone. Um, unlike New York, um, where Anna just said, you know, you can do it with, without a lot of resources. Michigan has specifically dedicated resources um, to the Michigan Poverty Law Program to be the, the leader and the organizer um, of statewide technology and to take on some of the tasks specifically. So um, what Michigan Poverty Law Program does um, related to technology for all the legal aid providers in the state, we host and maintain uh, PICA CMS, which is our um, case management system. Um, we uh, host all of these except for one legal aid program. Um, and we, these are big programs, small programs, law school clinics, itty bitty, two attorney, nonprofits. Um, anyone in the state who is a nonprofit legal aid provider 
um, can ask us to set up a, a PICA um, instance for them and we will do it. We will host it. We will uh, make sure it's up to date and maintained um, <clears throat> and make modifications, reasonable modifications as requested. Um, we do have one statewide resource for self-represented litigants. It is the Michigan Legal Help Program. So um, legal aid programs do not have their own uh, information, legal information for litigants. They each have their own sort of brochure where website about their services, um, but they leave all of the uh, education and self-help to us at Michigan Legal Help. And we all, and they, we work with them um, they don't contribute content, but we definitely take suggestions and recommendations and um, they often tell us what things need to be changed or um, added and that's really valuable input to us. Um, we have a statewide triage as part of the Michigan Legal Help website um, where we direct people to or, from, to or away from legal aid um, and we have centralized online intake. Um, that was built by Michigan Legal Help and Michigan Poverty Law Program. Um, and we customize it for each legal aid program. Um, but again, we build it, we maintain it, um, and all they have to do is uh, pick up the cases when they come into their PICA case management system. Um, MPLP IT staff maintains websites for statewide programs. Um, we have about 17 websites that we maintain. Um, as I mentioned, uh, legal aid programs maintain their own brochure where, you know, this is who we are and what we do websites, but um, because uh, we work with the statewide programs such as the Michigan Immigrant Rights Center, the Michigan Elder Justice Initiative, um, we uh, maintain all of, build and maintain all of those websites. Um, MPLP staff um, provide consultation services but it's not help desk style support. Um, we're not, uh, you know, troubleshooting why the internet doesn't work in, in someone's office. Um, we limit our consultation to our areas of expertise and we will consult up to the point where we need system access. Um, so what this means is that, you know, I might consult in project management of a technology project um, or our, web, our website, staff person might um, provide consultation on how to best lay out a website or how to build, you know, if someone wanted to build a Drupal website, which is a platform that we use, he might give them extensive consultation in terms of um, what modules to use for what things and things like that. Um, but he's not going to tell someone how to um, give any consultation on um, how to make a WordPress website, for instance, because that's not our area of expertise. Um, and then our systems administrator provides the, the most consultation um, because he's the most knowledgeable about the widest array of problems. Um, and again, people call him, people email him from all the other legal aid programs. Um, he provides consultation um, to different levels, but it's not, it's not help desk style. And it's not, it's not individual staff people. He will talk to each, a program's IT person or a program's director um, to give sort of that top level consultation. Um, there's no way that he could keep up with sort of a help desk style support. Um, but it is, it is, I see it as sort of the, the equivalent to what our MPLP staff attorneys do. They advise um, in areas of, of uh, legal matters and are, and provide consultation and direction and research. And so our IT staff sort of has that same role um, as it refers to IT. You know, MPLP attorneys don't write individual, you know, little briefs for people, just like our IT staff isn't going to provide help desk service. Um, just to take a few moments to talk about the roles of the three IT staff at MPLP, um, our systems administrator, uh, side note, he's leaving us. So if anyone wants to move to Michigan, it's a beautiful place. Um, we're hiring a systems administrator. Um, the, he maintains all of our IT for um, our larger program, not just MPLP, but the larger program that we're a part of called the Michigan Statewide Advocacy Services. And he works with um, the Michigan Advocacy Program tech, Technology Manager to co-manage those the two programs together. Um, he maintains, upgrades, creates, 
modifies PICA instances for everyone in the state. Um, he provides uh, <clears throat> assistance with some of the statewide technology projects um, that we do, like online intake. Um, we also did a recent TIG project that um, added texting capacity to PICA. Um, and so he played large roles in those uh, statewide projects. Um, and he assists with uh, training. We also do technology training a couple times a year as part of our role um, at MPLP. Um, he assists with those. And as I mentioned, uh, the consultation services. Our website coordinator uh, builds and maintains those statewide program websites. Um, and as I mentioned, all individual legal aid programs build and maintain their own websites, but we handle basically everything else, um, including Michigan Legal Help, statewide triage, online intake, um, and all of the, the statewide um, advocate, advocate and public facing websites. Um, finally, IT grants and project manager, that's me. Um, I supervise the IT staff. I build an annual work plan and a technology plan. I chair our LSCC meetings. Um, I project manage statewide projects like triage, online intake, PICA texting. Um, I'm the lead trainer and organizer, um, and I handle our IT specific grants. Um, we do partner with the Michigan Advocacy Program um, to apply for and work with TIGS. We also have um, a few other small streams of funding. Um, and I should mention, uh, to go back to that, to our, how, uh, how we uh, host and maintain all the PICA instances, we do charge a small amount of money for that. Um, we charge programs between $500 and $2,500 per program um, to maintain those websites. Um, which I'm going to talk about right now. So uh, Anna asked us to talk about a couple uh, sample initiatives to give you an idea of some of the things that we do. Um, the first one is that statewide uh, CMS. Um, as I mentioned, we host and maintain PICA instances for all legal aid providers in the state except for one, um, and many law school clinics and very small programs. And so I think we're at about 15 instances right now that, that we maintain. Um, we charge programs a small fee to cover the hosting um, and data storage and uh, statewide license. And that's, again, as I said, between $500 and $2,500 a year, depending on um, how many users, the number of modifications requested by the program, and um, the size of the storage. We also add modules like the texting and online intake to each program instance, uh, troubleshoot problems that they encounter. Um, we host all the instances and are responsible for backups, managing downtime, cons consulting on potential modifications. Um, and we lead, we take the lead on the statewide projects such as online intake and texting. So we contract with the vendor, PICA software, plan the project, manage the statewide meetings, do the initial testing, manage broader testing, um, and then do widespread training and implementation. Um, another project that we have done recently is uh, our, around electronic data storage and destruction. Um, over the last few years, this has become an issue as more and more um, programs store documentation on PICA. And so, you know, because we host those instances, we are aware of how much data that is and how much it's changing. Um, so uh, everyone was getting, we were getting concerned about storage space. And as a result, the programs were concerned about what that will do to their cost of PICA. Um, and so everyone wanted to talk about how to handle electronic file destruction. Um, so we had, uh, we dedicated uh, some time at our legal services computer committee meetings to talking about this. Um, and MPLP led the discussion. Um, did a bunch of research, and we drafted sample electronic data destruction policies um, with, with the Legal Services Computer Committee group and then shared them with the larger Legal Services Association of Michigan um, with all programs so that each program can modify and adopt some version of electronic data st destruction policy. Um, and then as people want to implement those policies, <coughs> we'll also um, provide the assistance um, for destroying old data within PICA. 
um, and also provide consultation on how other electronic data destruction can be managed within each program. Finally, um, one of our other initiatives is involving technology trainings, um, much so like just, the other. Just a quick question on the data dis destruction part. This is highly interesting to me as I'm, uh, one of the other projects we're working on at NTAP is the redrafting of privacy policies um, to include information about data destruction. Uh, was mm -hmm. that one of the things that you looked at as part of that, is what kind of disclosure you give to the public over the destruction of that information? Um, that was a little bit of it, but primarily we were interested in in just the logistics of how to manage it and, and more mm -hmm. how to manage it within our programs because um, it's a huge change in the way that people do business. If we're asking them to get rid of their files on the network drive, get, get rid of certain emails, in addition to sort of the, the easier things to get rid of, such as the old files in PICA. Definitely, and it, it's such an important thing from a security perspective, because keeping information you no longer lead, need uh, could cause a lot of harm if, if it's ever hacked into. So great right. job there. I think you're really leading the nation on that. Um, and I, <laughs> I would love to see uh, some of the work product from that be picked up by some of the other case management systems, because I know some of them don't even have the ability to delete stuff, and they've turned that off intentionally. Yeah. And, right. Yeah, I'm happy to share what we've come up with. I'd say we're sort of two thirds of the way through this. We've done a lot of planning and talking, but there hasn't been a lot of implementation yet, so. Okay, well, we'll <laughs> definitely follow the project as it moves forward and then try to take some of that and use it for other states and other programs. Awesome. Um, the last initiative I wanna talk about briefly um, is our, our, our technology trainings. Um, like the rest of MPLP is responsible for substantive law trainings and skills trainings, MPLP IT department is responsible for technology trainings. Um, we do fifth Friday trainings um, for any month that has five Fridays, um, which usually gives us three to four trainings a year. Um, and these are just for Michigan. Um, these are typically hour long webinars geared toward all legal services providers in the state. Um, any level, it can be uh, frontline staff or technology staff, we try to uh, talk about things that pertain to everyone. Um, we record these and we make the recordings and materials available on the Michigan Poverty Law Program website. Recent topics have included training on the two new PICA CMS features, the online intake and the texting. Um, we did one about conference calls and web conferencing. What are the best tools for meeting remotely? And we did have another one about reducing your storage footprint, optimizing files for sharing and storing. Michigan is also part of a four state effort um, to do training collaborative called the Committee on Regional Training. Um, and they do uh, big, you know, it's Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and West Virginia. Um, we get together and do skills training, like, you know, three or four day long skills trainings, um, one or two day long substantive law trainings. And then there's a fifth, there's a first Friday webinar every month um, that the four states rotate, and we've done a couple of technology trainings through that as well for an even bigger audience. We also try to alert people. Um, we have a listserv where we try to pass along information about LSNTAP webinars and other national resources of interest. So that's how we tackle that's um, responsibility for statewide technology training. And that is all I have today. Um, Again, I'm Angela Tripp. There's my email address. Um, it was great talking with you. And now I'm going to pass it off to Hannah. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm Hannah Kaufman. I am from the state of Illinois. Um, and I'm delighted to be here talking about this. This is a really important um, issue to us uh, in Illinois and one that we're, we're kind of right in the thick of thinking about and have been working on for some time. Um, I serve as the Council for Innovation and Technology for the Lawyers Trust Fund of Illinois, um, and that is our state's IOLTA program. So I'll talk a little bit more about my role um, as we get there, but in terms of giving you a little bit of context uh, for the state, um, 
So Illinois has uh, somewhere between 40 and 45 providers of, of civil legal aid services, depending on some of the smaller programs uh, and programs within programs and how you count those. Uh, three of those are large regional uh, LSC funded organizations that blink at the state. Um, and as you can imagine, and as others have mentioned, uh, we have a high concentration of legal aid providers in the city of Chicago. Um, and in our more rural areas, uh, some of the larger providers are responsible for serving as many as 70 counties just themselves. Uh, so there's less overlap there. In terms of the funding situation, as I mentioned, uh, the Lawyers Trust Fund is the IOLTA program, and that's where I work. Um, the three programs that are funded by LSC uh, take a majority of their funds from there. Uh, we have several other legal aid foundations in the state as well, the Chicago Bar Foundation, the Illinois Equal Justice Foundation, um, and the Illinois Bar Foundation are the primary ones. Um, and then several of our grantee organizations um, and other legal aid providers uh, are funded by the government or other uh, nonprofit foundations uh, that, that serve a broader audience and have grantees beyond just civil legal aid. Uh, I thought it was worth mentioning that about 90% of the providers that we fund uh, currently use legal server for case management. Um, it's, it, it's about 75% throughout the state and we serve 30, we, we fund rather 38 providers um, and about 90% of those are using legal server. Um, that has happened in part because in 2010, we asked uh, some of our larger grantee organizations which electronic case management system would you like to use? This decision should come from you, so why don't you do a little research, tell us what you decide, and then we will fund it. Um, and so they decided on legal server at the time, and we purchased it um, for them, and then others historically over the years have kind of gotten on board with legal server, but it was never um, an official policy or requirement for legal aid organizations. Um, in the state. Uh, so in terms of who does the coordination now, uh, there's there's several players in place. Um, Illinois Legal Aid Online or, or Leo um, is, is a major uh, force for coordination and collaboration throughout the state. Um, and they're really doing a great job of coordinating legal services and playing sort of a de facto uh, consultive role uh, as it comes to technology needs for legal aid organizations, but they don't necessarily provide any kind of uh, formalized statewide IT consulting services. So that's all sort of done um, on, a, on a program by program basis, either with staff or consultants, depending generally on the size of the program. So Aleo focuses largely on uh, their site, which is Illinois Legal Aid Org. It's our statewide website, um, and they're balancing many responsibilities, including serving pro se litigants with their site, um, managing, uh, creating, managing, and, and running our statewide online triage and intake system, um, and providing information to attorneys, but that's generally support for them um, in their role as attorneys um, in, the, in the legal aid area. Uh, so it's it's more substantive legal support on a statewide basis as opposed to uh, technology support specifically. Um, we also have Carpel's Legal Aid, um, which is a hotline and provider of brief legal services um, and a source of referrals uh, to legal aid programs. They are based in Chicago and uh, since 1992 have been working exclusively in Chicago and Cook County. Uh, but as of this year, they have taken um, some steps uh, to, to pilot uh, serving as a hub for the full state of Illinois. And so uh, with a pilot program that I'll talk about in a little bit, they are now um, really working uh, to coordinate service delivery um, across the state as well. Um, so those are the two main providers that work in that capacity. Um, I, I mentioned that I would come back to my role, um, and I, I think it's worth noting because um, our IELTSA program is the only program, to my knowledge, in the country uh, that has created a position called Council for Innovation and Technology, um, and that role was really created, uh, we're still figuring out exactly what the parameters of it 
are, um, but it's it's really represents a commitment from the the state's funding body, um, not just to fund specific statewide initiatives that relate to innovation and technology, but to also provide staff support in the way of leadership uh, guidance and and quite a bit of project management for some of these statewide initiatives. So. Um, I, I thought that was worth mentioning in that it's kind of a different approach uh, that a funder could take. So if there are any funders or um, if you're ever in touch with your local IELTS program, I recommend, you know, considering this model. So Sounds like if, there's a question. If you're willing to send us over the, the job description and a, a short bit about what you do on a regular basis, we're happy to turn that into a blog post because I think that's the type of strategic leadership we need a lot more of coming from IOLTAs and funders in particular. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I would be delighted to. Let's let's talk later um, because the job posting, so I've been there nearly two years now, so I can certainly share the job posting um, and a little bit about what I do, how connected those really are <laughs> remains to be seen. So there, there might be, um, I, I think there has been some evolution in exactly what the job description looks like but I'd be happy to speak to that more. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think that is something that we should be looking to uh, create more of on a, on a national level. So yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, the, the final uh, source of coordination, and this sort of goes, uh, you know, again, to my role as, as being an employee of a, of a funding organization, um, the Illinois Equal Justice Foundation um, in particular, um, has a staff member who is working on a pilot project and that individual is, is playing an enormous role in terms of project management as well uh, for some of the statewide coordination projects. So it's really sort of leaders of specific projects at legal aid organizations. Certainly Aleo is always playing a major role. Carpels is often playing a major role as well. Um, and then there are staff members at funding organizations as well who are sort of stepping up and supporting these specific projects that are focused on statewide collaboration. Um, and what you'll not see here that um, Anna and Angela have talked a little bit about is there really isn't sort of a formalized statewide IT support network. Um, and that's a gap that we're curious about and, and thinking about and thinking about how we can best support uh, the legal aid community, particularly smaller legal aid programs that don't necessarily have the resources to have full-time IT support um, in-house and maybe need a little bit more hand-holding when it comes to using something like legal server. Uh, so that's something to think about. And in terms of the framing of the rest of this conversation with respect to Illinois, I kind of mapped it out as, as the ghost of collaboration past, present, and future. And I'm thinking of this as experiments. And I think that's really the best way to describe it because we have taken sort of an experimental model with the state where we've tried some different things. Um, and some of them have worked and have remained in place. Others, you know, are, are current experiments. Um, and, and the reason I think that's an important framing is because you'll see as we get to where we're going in the future, we really wanna take a look at how do we coordinate all of these different experiments? And what is the value of having them run in parallel in some respects, as opposed to um, as, as Angela is doing in Michigan, having one very clear centralized method for coordinating the technologies um, in the state. Instead, we've sort of had these more organic springing up opportunities for collaboration, and now we have to coordinate the coordination. So in terms of what we've done in the past, um, just a little sampling, um, I mentioned that there is no centralized statewide IT support desk. Um, my organization, the Lawyers Trust Fund, did um, attempt a, a sort of statewide help desk um, idea uh, previously, um, and that was abandoned relatively early on in part because we were really not the, the, the proper organization 
to be hosting that as much as we can provide some of that strategic guidance um, we're really not um, staffed appropriately or resourced appropriately or we weren't at the time at least um, to be able to answer those questions um, about you know how do I fix my printer um, and we also um, we noticed and this is something I think other states can learn from that it kind of matters who is giving the advice and when a funder is telling you here is what we think you should do with this particular system uh, it may decrease some of the intrinsic motivation that the staff of a legal aid program would have had uh, to use that system because now they're being forced to by a funder where they don't really have a choice so we want to avoid that um, and so i think out of some of that experience um, we learned to take um, a more um, hands-off approach in terms of decision making which um, is something that has consequences as well um, and we need to think a little bit about now so that's one past experiment um, the the middle one is the collaborative data system task force and that is um, an experiment that was funded by a TIG grant um, and it was um, a collaboration among all three LSC funded programs in Illinois and Illinois Legal Aid Online. And what they did was they collected, um, made uniform and cleaned all of their data um, so that they could really compare program by program and get a sense of the whole working of the state, which is excellent. Um, and I think the primary lesson learned from that uh, or the lessons learned from that are one um, it is very hard to get programs to agree um, on certain language and certain data fields um, particularly when it comes to something as sensitive as outcome measures which we tried and, and simply weren't able to to get agreement on um, and it also requires quite a bit of attention to keep up and people are still um, submitting their data into the system, I think on a quarterly basis, but we haven't invested the resources on a statewide level for somebody to actually be looking at that. So um, so these, these systems require support and they require support in the way of funding and they also require support in the way of um, actual um, eyes on a project. Uh, the final uh, experiment is, is legal self-help centers, which is a way of sort of extending Illinois Legal Aid Online's reach of their website throughout the state um, by equipping different uh, libraries and courts with self-help centers um, throughout the state, particularly in rural areas, um, and training people to walk people through um, Aleo's site. Um, and again, that's something that really requires a lot of maintenance in order to make it meaningful. And I, I'm not sure that we've always, uh, as a state, um, invested as, as we might have in that. In terms of the present collaboration experiments, I think this is where things get really exciting, um, probably just because we're in it now. But um, we do have an online triage and intake system. This is a statewide system that is run through Illinois Legal Aid Online's website uh, that does some triaging uh, for the public of their legal issues if they indicate that they want legal help. If they don't have, if, if the state does not have a legal aid provider that is, has already indicated that they're willing to take this case and have capacity to do so, then the individual who's online will be diverted out um, and presented with either referrals, well, not either. They will be presented with referrals to legal aid programs um, in a variety of methods. They will be presented with self-help tools, uh, things like guided interviews um, and, and checklists and forms. Um, and they will be provided with legal information in the way of text generally uh, from Aleo's site. If, on the other hand, um, a legal aid program is able to accept the case, and we currently have uh, seven programs accepting cases um, as intakes through this system, um, then the, the system will collect a little bit of uh, information um, and send it through to uh, the different seven programs as appropriate. So that's an exciting um, experiment in uh, collaboration of service delivery. And so Aleo is hosting that program. 
um, and it has a Drupal front end, but then they're using a statewide instance of legal server uh, to maintain sort of the, the holding queue of cases as they come in. And then each of the different partner programs that is accepting intakes through the system also uses legal server and they receive those as an e-transfer. Um, so whenever that's ready. So what we're working on right now, this system has been in place since 2013. Um, and this year we are doing, um, and, and my organization is funding and we're sort of spearheading um, along with Aleo, uh, a multi-month comprehensive assessment of how the system is working, where there are improvements that can be made, uh, what the ideal role for a system like this is in the, the legal aid ecosystem more broadly in the state, um, and what changes we want to make moving forward, what are we committed to as a state. So we've never really taken that comprehensive a look before. Um, and what we want to do now is really take a step back um, and and see what makes sense moving forward. Uh, so that's one program. Um, we're also, um, I've mentioned a couple of times, Carpel's evolving role as a statewide leader in this space. Um, and they are really uh, the leaders, um, along with the Illinois Equal Justice Foundation, of a pilot project called uh, the Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network, which is a network of legal aid programs throughout the state serving veterans specifically. Um, and the entry point is Carpel's hotline. Um, and then much like the online triage and intake system, uh, people enter by phone and then the cases are either handled in-house through Carpel's providing brief advice um, on the spot or they're referred out to one of the network partners. And that, from a technology standpoint, Carpels uses um, a highly customized version of Salesforce. And so what we're noticing is that there are challenges because the majority of our legal aid programs use legal server and Carpels uses Salesforce. And so the interoperability challenges are, are something that we are working through right now. Um, so that's another example. Um, and then uh, LTF, where I work, um, has invested um, over the years in several business process analysis projects to help grantees um, revise systems uh, and, and processes that they have in place to, to help them be more efficient. And this current round of BPA projects that we just provided funding for and that are starting up over the summer, uh, both projects that we funded involve collaborations among two different organizations. Um, and those are sort of going to be used as a model of how or whether BPA is an effective technique to help facilitate collaboration um, among different organizations um, and then try to extrapolate onto a statewide level how do these lessons learned apply um, and how can we expand the collaboration and what kind of facilitative support do we need and what kind of funding for that support do we need uh, to get to the next level. So that's what we're looking at next. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the future really is we have all of these individual pieces of the collaboration puzzle. And again, I'm sort of for focusing on coordinating service delivery. Um, and now we're, we're looking at the next level, which is coordinating that coordination. Um, and I just wanted to talk about some considerations that we're wrestling with right now. Some of these are trade-offs and some of these are really just ideas. Uh, the first is an idea of customizability versus uniformity. Um, and so in particular, with, with respect to the online triage and intake system, what we've noticed is that we have leaned highly in a direction of customizability. And so each of the programs that accept online intakes through Aleo's site and through that system are able to actually write their logic for how people end up at their door themselves. And that is excellent because programs really want control over who's coming in their door. And that makes a lot of sense. The challenge with customizability is that it requires a lot of resources in the way of training, oversight, potentially developing an administrative interface that can be costly. Um, and so we're running into a lot of challenges uh, that are being revealed through our uh, evaluation of the OTIS system, uh, where we're noticing that we've gone so far in the direction of customizability 
that people love the idea of the control that they can have, but they are intimidated by the interface and don't actually know how to execute that in, in reality. And so the system isn't being used as much as we would like. Um, on the flip side of that is, is this uniformity idea where you know we say we're going to do this particular screening for financial eligibility for legal aid. Um, and if you're one of those seven programs, then let's hope that we can all agree on what that financial eligibility threshold is. Um, and that's historically been difficult, um, but I think uh, you know there, there's some value to considering that. Question? Yep. Um, so, so that's one piece of the puzzle. Um, the next two are, are sort of, you know, how do we structure resources, particularly from the position of a funder, but really on a statewide level, uh, to support and sustain some of these initiatives. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's great to put something collaborative in place, um, and it requires a lot of the ongoing maintenance and attention um, and human touch. Um, and then, you know, with respect to collective action challenges, I think, you know, when you do have collective ownership over a particular project or, or initiative, it can be challenging to uh, see who's exactly taking the lead um, and make it um, a high priority for each individual uh, program uh, or person working on it. Um, and then the final piece, which I, I kind of hinted at earlier, and I'm not really sure that interoperability versus duplication is the right way of framing this. Uh, but these are two ideas that we're thinking a lot about. Um, and as I've talked about in Illinois, we have the majority of people using legal server, which is phenomenal in many ways because it has made things like the online triage and intake system very possible and very easy in some ways because we can just transfer cases easily among the statewide instance and individual programs instances and the process is the same across all of these and so that is very helpful um, and i can see the value of having everyone using the same uh, case management system being being very valuable um, the challenge for us comes in in the fact that it's not a hundred percent of people using legal server and so when you throw a um, you know a carpals into the mix and carpals is uh, playing a, a truly coordinating role in the state uh, when it comes to service delivery, and they're using Salesforce, we need to work through exactly how that all works um, so that we are having a seamless experience, um, of course, for the clients and that their information is moving from one system to another smoothly, but also for the legal aid programs so that we can minimize the number of places that they're logging in. Um, so, so that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, kind of on the flip side of that is, is the idea of duplication of services. And I think that this is a little bit of a double-edged sword. So I think the, the common wisdom that I certainly agree with is that we don't want to be duplicating services. We have huge amounts of unmet need in legal aid and few providers, and it is ridiculous that we are not able to coordinate them so that people are doing what makes sense for them to be working on. When it comes to the technical piece, I think there may be some value in experimenting with different systems and seeing, okay, we can try it this way where we're stringing together multiple systems, or we're gonna try it this way where maybe there's a system that comprehensively walks somebody start to finish through an entire process and yes, there's duplication of those systems. And the value of that is that we're still kind of maintaining this experimental model where we're testing things out and seeing maybe we learn from the duplication uh, some lessons that we wouldn't have learned as easily had we only had one player in that space. So that's something that we're thinking about and, and working towards resolving. And we're, we're very excited about the future um, and bringing all of those individual circles together. Thank you so much for listening, and I would uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much. I'm going to turn this over now to Susan. Here we go. Thank you, Hannah, and good afternoon, all. I'm Susan Lucas, and I work as a compliance consultant to the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network, which is viewed generally as a state support center. 
I apologize for the lack of video. My webcam is experiencing some technical difficulties this afternoon. I've been working in legal aid in one capacity or another for almost 40 years, having spent 15 years in a program. And then I kind of just fell into consulting by accident in 1993. And the rest of it is pretty much history. I don't consider myself a techie, but I do have a major role in Pennsylvania in case management and also in planning for statewide technology coordination. And I will give you a quick overview of Pennsylvania. As you can see here in the pictures, we uh, have a beautiful city in Pittsburgh in the west at night. And then we're also seeing the Lehigh Valley over toward the west in the fall, for those of you who like more of a getting back to nature instead of urban areas. <clears throat> in Pennsylvania, we have eight regional programs and six specialty projects that are funded by the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network. The regional programs, except for one, are basically general legal services programs and community legal services in Philadelphia primarily addresses systemic issues and does legislative and administrative adv advocacy. The spe six specialty projects focus on health law, institutional law, affordable housing, utility advocacy, migrant and immigration issues, and the sixth project focuses primarily on class action litigation and innovative advocacy. The major funders of the Pen Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network are the PA Department of Human Resources, NIOLTA, and we do not receive LSC funding, but of course, most of the programs that are recipients of planning funds do receive the LSC funds. Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network has a role in training, providing regional and statewide training for advocates, including CLE trainings. We hold an annual statewide conference with one pre-conference day of legal server training. There's an annual fiscal training, a separate technology summit each year, and we also sponsor a robust Martin Luther King Intern and Fellowship Program. There is some statewide coordination of technology, though there are a variety of factors and available funding basically that drive different priorities at the program level. We do not have someone on staff at Plan Inc. coordinating technology. We tried that with several different hires, and for some reason in Pennsylvania, that project simply was not successful. In May of 2017, we had everyone come together for a statewide leadership conference, and I will talk more about that in detail shortly. We're fortunate enough to have 100% of the plan funded programs plus the second legal aid program that is LSC funded in Philadelphia using the legal server case management system. And I've been asked to talk in detail about how we actually achieved that dream. There's no statewide helpline in Pennsylvania for intake brief services or, or referrals. Most of the regional programs have centralized intake units and they basically start client services through those units with significant walk-in traffic in the Philadelphia and the Pittsburgh offices. PLAN does provide some technology support. As I mentioned already, we do have an annual technology summit. And then every other year, we fold that annual technology summit into our semi-annual leadership conference. And we just held that in May. And again, 
I will expand the discussion on that shortly. Plan recently relaunched a redesigned website, and we're now working on a VOCA grant application with the hope of getting some funds to implement a chat feature for those in need of legal help. The liaison role for case management is primarily to ensure compliance with the many requirements of the plan funding sources and to oversee case tracking and centralized reporting. I have that role for Pennsylvania as a consultant, and I've been doing that kind of work for more years than I care to recall. We also are having technology systems assessments done for some of the programs. Planic has contracted with Just Tech, who's completed one program assessment. We have two more scheduled. And basically what we're looking to do is have these done statewide for those programs that would benefit from some constructive input from the experts at Just Tech. I've been asked to talk about two particular Plan Inc. statewide initiatives that have had impact for all of our programs. As you can see from this picture of the May Leadership Conference, we had excellent turnout and the conference was very well received. The leadership conference itself was held at a central location in Pennsylvania. We chose State College. Um, everybody likes to go to the home of uh, Penn State University and we make sure to do this when classes are not in session. The Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network sponsors these leadership conferences, paying for the hotels and the meals, the trainer and speaker expenses, which certainly has proven for us to be a great incentive to get people to attend. For this year's conference, we had Anna Steele and Michael Bowman, who was formerly with Just Tech, and before that spent 10 years employed on the IT staff at Community Legal Services work with us and the technology leadership of the programs to plan for the technology track of this conference. We cast a wider net this year than we usually do, including resource development and PR staff, and they join the directors, the IT staff, and the fiscal management in this leadership conference. Our primary goals of the conference were to emphasize the importance of effective communications internally among these four groups of leaders. We have found in the past that there are some challenges to making sure that these four groups that are instrumental in moving the program forward are actually communicating with each other in an effective manner. It's not unusual, not unusual for us at PLAN to hear from staff members that the directors are putting in some proposal and they've not asked fiscal to prepare the budget. Or the IT staff has gotten the approval of manage, management for large purchase of technology and it's something fiscal managers were unaware of and it's not in the budget. So we took the opportunity this year to bring the four groups together and have a communication session to try to get them to be a lot more cognizant of communicating timely with each other. We also did a messaging session on how to promote civil legal aid we had Martha Bergmark conduct that session, and it was really well received by everyone in attendance. We also had a combined session on the national state of technology so people could stay informed. And then we provided from some other sessions some learning opportunities and roundtable discussions in smaller breakout groups. The particular sessions in the technology track focused on opportunities for IT staff and some of the other attendees 
that have some tech overlap responsibilities to discuss the state of technology within Pennsylvania and for them to share best practices that are happening within the programs. There were two breakout sessions we did in technology and those were facilitated by staff from Just Tech. The, those sessions were about optimizing technology for client services. One of them were for the IT folks who tend to get into the techie weeds with their talk. And the second one was more for other attendees to discuss opportunities to use technology so they could streamline client services and have those discussions in a non-techie type of language. We found too often when you mix the two groups, you have the non-techies tend to glaze over very quickly at times. So at the recommendation of Just Tech, we decided to split the two groups. One of the main themes of this leadership conference was to encourage not just more communication, but more teamwork among program leaders of these four groups with the hope that we would see them working much more together and collaboratively as they work to enhance technology. And so these groups aren't moving as much, aren't working as much in isolation. From our leadership conference and other conferences, including the Tech Summit and the annual fiscal conference, we learned the same lessons that Anna had mentioned, and that is that we tend to try to build way too much into too short of a period of time. And what we end up doing is having to cut the sessions too short. The trainers don't have enough time for any kind of an, kind of an exchange with the attendees. And our evaluation has indicated that we need to be lighter with the agenda topics and allow more time. It's also clear to us that attendees do prefer to have adequate networking time, especially during gatherings for breakfast and for lunch. So we try to stay clear of scheduling speakers so they'll have time to basically share ideas and network with one another. Another challenge that we have, which is very hard to overcome, is there are always conflicting sections of interest to individuals forcing them to choose. And ideally, we've had people indicate to us that it would be great to be able to have some repeat of some of the sessions so they could attend more than one. But of course, unfortunately, that it means extending the conference and people simply cannot get out of the office and devote that much time to these kind of statewide efforts. So they do have to make a choice what they want to attend. The next session I've been asked to talk about, or the topic I should say, is for those of you who are they're interested in achieving the dream of a statewide case management reporting system. It is not an easy thing to accomplish, but we have found now that we have gotten to that end goal, it was worth all the effort and the time, and the programs are much more satisfied with what they are currently using. Back before we undertook this project, we had most of the programs using an old version of John Kemp's Prime. Community Legal Services and Philadelphia Legal Assistance were using Legal Server and had been for several years. Then we had some of these smaller specialty projects using their own internally designed case management system. And the differences in these systems made it very difficult from time to time for the programs to report uniform data to Plan Inc, which they are required to do. So anytime a program would update their own case management system, we ended up with compatibility issues. 
So that was just one of the many reasons that we wanted to move the Pennsylvania programs to uniform system. The first step of this process for us was to build consensus among the programs and one of our key funders, which is IOLTA. We started the process by getting input from a variety of different people in the programs, including case management specialists, leadership, advocates, those who supervise advocates, administrative staff. And we gathered this ongoing input because it was very, very crucial that everybody viewed this project as a team goal and that everybody was really satisfied with the decisions that were being made and really embraced this great opportunity. We also involved IOLTA from the onset because they too always wanted to see Pennsylvania in a uniform case management system. So they were involved from the onset. Once you build consensus and programs are willing to move forward, the major challenge is you need to find the funds. And in Pennsylvania, we were very fortunate because IOLTA had recently received some Cypre funds that were initially slated for general services by the programs and they were going to allocate the funds to the programs. But we had built the consensus and IOLTA was willing to target those funds to moving all of the programs to a uniform system with the understanding that every program had to agree to make the change. So that's how we ended up in Pennsylvania, getting the money to do this project. I will tell you that the entire cost of this project was somewhere in the vicinity of about $800,000. It is a major undertaking. That does not include any monthly user fees for the system to be maintained by legal server. The next step was to select the system and the vendor. We brought all interested parties together, again, in a statewide meeting and invited the vendors from, for Prime Legal Server and Legal Files to do on-site demonstrations and to be present for questions. After they did their presentations, we spent the rest of the day having an in-depth discussion of the pros and cons of each of the system. There was overwhelming preference for legal server. And one of the reasons that many expressed the desire to move to legal server was because it was web-based. And that was a very strong factor in Pennsylvania in us making that decision. Once the decision was made, the next step was to negotiate the purchase and support agreement with PS Technology. And that was done between Plan and Ivy Ashton of Legal Server. Negotiating that contract took several months for obvious reasons, but eventually we got it signed and every program was signed as a party to the agreement. The next step then was to designate a statewide project manager. We did not believe that we had anyone at Plan Inc. or in the programs that could take on that role. So our initial plan was to outsource the project manager role. And that worked well for us for maybe three or four months till our project manager decided to take a full-time job with the legal aid program. And so we were left without a project manager and at that point we reevaluated and decided to bring that in-house as I was asked to oversee that project. I agreed to take on the role because it was aligned with many of my other responsibilities at Plan Inc. But a major lesson that I learned is that given the number of programs that we had in Pennsylvania and what is required of this, 
if you're fortunate, fortunate enough to be able to get this far, it's really important that you dedicate a staff position where you have a temporary person or you outsource, outsource the work for managing this project because I found that it probably took up about 60-65% of my time in addition to all the other work that I was committed to during this implementation period. So that's just a little bit of advice if you go down this road. Each of the programs, they were asked to form an implementation committee with a chair. The chair was responsible for keeping the staff moving forward that was on the committee and to serve as a liaison to me as the project manager and to the staff a legal server. That committee had weekly onboarding calls with legal server. I was present on all those calls unless they had a conflict that was unavoidable. And they also had weekly internal meetings among themselves because every week they had project tasks that had to be performed as they prepared for their next onboarding, onboarding meeting with legal server. We staggered the transition, um, usually doing one program about every six to eight weeks, but I avoided late November and December because with the holiday season, the last thing you wanna do is transition a program to a new case management system. The training was provided by legal server staff and they came on site along with me for all of the regional programs and one or two of the specialty projects. We did most of the specialty project training before go live with, uh, by webinars simply because they had small staffs, even though some of them have offices statewide and it was just too difficult to try to bring six, seven, eight people together in a central location. Okay. Um, another lesson that I learned was that this project and transitioning of it doesn't end on day one when you go live with the new system. Pennsylvania, we failed to keep these implementation committees active after the transition. And that was a mistake simply because legal server or any case management system that you have, as all of you know, it's always a work in progress. As you continue to expand your services, you change your delivery systems, you take on special projects, um, it always impacts the case management system. So you need a small working group who's always going to make sure that whatever you're doing in the program, the case management system is keeping pace. There were many other lessons that were learned from this project, but that goes way beyond the scope of this webinar. If any of you are considering this kind of move statewide, or even if you're considering it within your own program, I would be happy to have further discussions with you uh, about about the transitioning process and how we made it happen, free feel, feel free to email me at any time and I will be glad to set up a call. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to change the presenter back for closing comments. A huge thank you to uh, Angela, Hannah, and Susan for their uh, contribution to today's webinar. Um, I hope that you guys found it informative and uh, that there are some things that you can take back to your own states. Um, Sart, anything else? No, that? I wanted to thank you guys so much. We covered a huge amount of content today. Um, I definitely encourage people to reach out to each of the presenters if you have any uh, questions regarding the different topics that they talked about today uh, as we covered so much today. 
Um, thank you so much for coming out. I love to see the coordination that's going on on a statewide level. Um, and several of these topics, we could do a single webinar over them. So thank you for the overview. And uh, there will be a survey that follows this up. If one of these topics is something you want to hear more about, please put that into the survey. We will take that into consideration when planning our webinars for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.